always enjoy having my special guests today. It's Tom and Cecil of Cognitive Dissonance and the Cogdis Podcast. Hey, guys. Good to have you. How you doing? Hey, hey Seth. We're great, How are man. you? It was crazy. I want to say thanks. You there. The, we are we um, literally to like, is how I, like to think I was <laughs> celebrating my 600th broadcast. I was about to. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I hear, hey, Cog, this is celebrating 600, <laughs> like three days before me. Thanks for stealing all my thunder. <laughs> Thanks for stealing all of the, just the ebullience, I and think. The ce celebratory mood. <laughs> I we think so. Have, so. I think, Seth, you have been doing this longer than us, but for a time, maybe a year and a half, Tom and I were releasing two episodes we were. a week. Yeah. And so for like a year and a half, there's like 26 extra episodes. So like we, we quietly stuck, snuck ahead of you, but we started in <laughs> April of 2011. So we're, we're, that's hard yeah. to believe. Yeah. So. Like, do you look back at a decade plus of content and you think, yeah, yeah. how do we get here? <laughs> yeah. Like, how, did, how does this happen? I, right? Especially because every week I show up and I'm like, I got nothing to say today. No, I don't believe that at all. <laughs> 600 You have so much to say. <laughs> you have so much to say. You wrote a book. We did. And in true Tom and Cecil style, you managed to get some profanity in the actual <laughs> book title. And I, I laud you for that. The Grand Unified Theory of Bullshit. Okay, let's talk about it. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, but first, we have to, we have to disclaim that bullshit is the colloquial yes, bullshit. Yes, we found this out last week. We, we discovered from uh, Aaron Rabinowitz from the Embrace the Void podcast that there is evidently an academic bullshit. definition for bullshit. We had no idea. We had no idea. It seems like bullshit. Yeah, me. we didn't realize. Hang on. But Hold on. Yes. Yeah. I'm not tracking. There, yeah. there is an academic definition for bullshit that is different than how you and I would define it in the yeah everyday. we're using the we're you you and I are you when you say bullshit we're using the colloquial yeah you know everyday version but there is an academic and debated definitional term of bullshit which like scholars with nothing better to do wrestle with from time to time I'm to understand I remember exactly what the definition I don't remember was. either because he I'm described not, it to us and I was like I, no that's not us admittedly. I'm not smart enough to know. So like, I don't, I don't necessarily know how or what he was talking about, but he did say that there were people who were debating this fact in the phil philosophical realm. Yeah. And we both had to quickly admit that when we wrote the book that had never occurred to us. Cause he literally just told us it 30 <laughs> seconds ago. Yeah. This sounds like the kind of stuff philosophers talk about, <laughs> right? It's up there with, you know, free will. Are you a compatibilist or are you a determinist? And of course, the rest of us are like, oh my God. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I have a degree. I have All right. A, I have a degree in philosophy. Book. Hold on. I have a degree in philosophy, and I just want to say you're absolutely oh, right. You're 100% right. <laughs> you're 100% right. That is 100% like, navel gazing. Don't tell Aaron Rabinowitz I said that. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I've seen the debates. We I was part of a Pan, I, I was watching a panel discussion at a free thought event in Canada. This was years and years and years ago. And they had like two philosophers and two actual scientists. Uh -huh. And I thought it was going to be a cage match. Like the philosophers are trying to get into the meaning of all things, et cetera, et cetera. And the scientists, I think one actually crawled on the table and was pounding his fist. <laughs> like, like he, they had no use for philosophy. <laughs> and uh, that's a whole other show, right? Whether or not we have, I mean, I, I, I like it. I like the philosophical questions, but I also know that there's a lot of this sort of uh, really thick, pedantic chin scratching that goes on, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to put it. I'm yes, going to steal that. I'm just, I'm just saying. All right. Yeah. The book. You start off, talk about philosophical. You talk about the human condition, and you talk about how we are bias machines. And, you know, I, I've been talking about this a lot recently. I've been working on a, a speech I'm going to be giving around the country talking about how, you know, we have this sort of we lean into the things that validate us. Mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. I'm really interested in many of my fellow lefties, humanists, seculars, atheists, who think they don't do this. <laughs> uh, oh, no, only no. these other people are. They're motivated by bias. Yeah. We, of course, we have managed true objectivity, which is complete <laughs> horseshit. Nonsense. Or it's bullshit, but not the right. scientific <laughs> definition. <of bullshit. laughs> right. Right. But we see the world we want to see. 
And so that brings us into the grand unified theory. Somebody define it and talk to me about bias. You know, when we first started writing this, the reason why we even put pen to paper was that for, at this point, 11 years, it was 11 years, I think, last year, we had, or maybe it was 10 years last year, 11 years now, but it was, it was 10 years last year, we had seen time and time and time again topics come up that are from different areas, right? So you'll see a cryptid story or you'll see a, you'll see a story about um, some sort of miraculous event that happened where somebody was like drinking sewer water off a wall or you'll see, you'll see all these different things and, you know, conspiracy theories. We saw the birth of Q on our show. Yep. I mean, we saw the birth of yep. Q. We saw all this stuff and, and we started to see that there was these little pieces that drew them together. So we look like the guy with all the push pins in the, in the board that's got the yarn on them. And we're that guy. Right. But at the same time, we think, you know, there is something that is tying all this together. And we came to the conclusion that it's a lot of it is the will to believe. Like we want to believe it. We want to believe yeah. in heaven. We want to believe in cryptids because there's some kind of mystery. We want to believe that, you know, God is, is, is controlling and Jesus can take the wheel once in a while. We want to believe that stuff because it's comforting or because it has an air of mystery to it. Or in conspiracies case, it makes us the detective that is peeling away this onion and showing the world exactly what is happening out there. And so there's this really deep desire to want to believe it. Yeah. And then the main thrust of the book was at the, especially at the end was, okay, well, how do we guard ourselves against that? How do we stop ourselves from wanting to believe nonsense? Tom, I mean, you talk to me about, you know, the best and worst of human tendencies when it comes to what we do and don't accept. Yeah. So I think Cecil, Cecil hit it, but maybe just to add some color to it, the, the, the point that, that keeps getting driven home, and it's the point you alluded to as well, is that um, we have to recognize that we are not the outlier. We are not above the fray. So when we all have the same tendency to look at the things that we don't believe, right? We look at the things that, that we know are bullshit, and everybody, no matter who you are, everybody has something that lives in their bullshit column. And, and that's fine. That's great. That's good. But we have to recognize that we are not the outlier. There are things that likely live in your your column of cherished beliefs or ideas that you hold to be true that may smell exactly like the bullshit if you run them through the same fair rubric. The problem is that we don't identify those pieces that we are motivated to love and to enjoy and to cherish and to feel validated by in the same way because most of those beliefs come to us in these really insidious ways. So most beliefs that we end up with, we don't end up with as a result of, you know, a careful and long-term considered stance that we've evaluated over time. We just, we're fucking swimming in the soup. That's it. We're swimming in the soup of something. Whether we're swimming in the soup of Q, because that's the virtual space that we're in, whether we're swimming in the soup of alternative medicine, because we're scared and we're sick and there are people that are offering to help, whether we're swimming in the soup of any kind of conspiratorial nonsense, whether it's K, we're, we're in there. And it's very likely that most of us have some thoughts. Now, whether they're these big sort of categorical beliefs or whether they're other parts of our belief system, we have to have some tools, some mechanism to see that, to be clear about it, to say, okay, look, if all bullshit smells the same, what am I, what am I in love with? Which of my ideas am I in love with? And the more in love with an idea that you are, the more likely you need to spend more time thinking about it before you're really sure of it. You're so agitated about this is because I think your aura is not <laughs> properly charged positively. You know, I'm surprised you, you get saw into that because the Reiki meta. guy smoothed it yeah, out right before he, I got he, here. Yeah, he had those things. And I had my chakras realigned and everything. <laughs> I feel like I'm paying money for nothing, Seth. <laughs> I mean... Have you guys ever gotten, have you ever tried the shark cartilage or the, you know, the, the acupuncture or the, oh. I'm going to get tons of crap for loading acupuncture in with, you know, healing crystals right, and right, stuff. Right. Have you guys ever dipped your toe into those waters or you, you just I watched have. it from the outside or what? Yeah, I, I, I went to a uh, Chinese medicine doctor. So I used to get, I didn't know that I had asthma. So I have, I have asthma, but I didn't know it. And so 
until I was like sometime in my early 30s, I would get these terrible unrelenting coughs that would last six, eight months. I mean, they were terrible. They would, I was so sick and I was like, God, I fucking, I'm always getting sick. Um, and at one point I, I got roped into going to this Chinese medicine doctor who did uh, moxibustion and acupuncture and Chinese herbs and these little seedlings on tape and all this fucking shit. Um, none of which I really thought was going to help, but I mean, I was, I, I am sympathetic to alternative medicine more than I am to a lot of other bullshit from a consumer perspective, because there are a lot of times when people get sick and they don't get help. And at some point after you've been sick over and over or again and again, or still and still, um, it's very difficult to not do whatever else is out there. Um, so yeah, I, I, I went, it didn't do anything. I didn't think it was going to, and it didn't, it was nonsense. And it turns out I have something called cough variant asthma. And what I needed was asthma medicine and it clears it right up as a matter of fact. Turns I mean, out this that is our asthma gripe, though, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> but, it, but to I be totally fair, get, you know, it took people, 20 some 30 years to diagnose it. Yeah. In times of desperation, people are grasping, right? Yeah. Uh, give me a solution. I'll shotgun it. Let's throw something on the wall and see what sticks. Can sure, deal. Yeah. But of course, this is this is fertile ground for the opportunist, right? With the health and wellness exactly. industry yes. being a trillion dollar yeah. industry. Yeah. And I think, man, if you're selling hope to often hopeless people, that's a pretty it's a pretty good business model for the grifter, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's that is when we are at our most vulnerable. Yeah. And the grifters know that. They know that when you're sick and you're tired and you're scared and when you're desperate for something. I mean, look at it, church is another great example. I mean, church relies on and capitalizes on that idea of, hey, look, sometimes people feel vulnerable. They're worried about their loved ones when they're sick and they're dying. And, you know, we're, we have we have these ideas that we want to be better, but we don't know how to be better. We don't know where to get our morals from. We're in need of some kind of absolution from things that we feel like we've we've done wrong in our lives. And churches, religions have forever seized upon that vulnerability and capitalized on those moments of human frailty and weakness, which are just part of the natural extension of the human condition. They, they capitalize on it. Um, and they make us want to believe. And the other thing that they do, and they all do it, is they build community. Alternative medicine builds community. Cryptids Bigfoot, aliens, yetis, mosques and synagogues, yeah, right, yeah. they all build community. And they're really effective at doing that because they know that with the social element, we will be less critical of the times when they fail us, when the times when they don't make sense, when the times that our logical fa faculties would otherwise be screaming at us that this makes no sense at all. So we need to be careful. We need to separate like, look, you know, this person is my friend and I love them. It doesn't mean they're right about this specific issue. And I can still love this person. I can still be loved by this person. But it doesn't mean that they're right. And I need to critically evaluate that. Um, and that is a tough thing now, to you know, ask people to do. It's hard to ask I'm people to sorry, do. I'm sorry, Tom. I'm sorry you've bought into the party line, <laughs> the, the pharma, big pharma line. I'm sorry. You, you, science to you is just another religion. Uh, <laughs> right? I mean, that's normally what they come after us with. You know, yeah, I'm sorry you take the, the, yeah, right. the pharmaceutical company's word for it as if, you know, gravitating toward science-based medicine and evidence-based medicine that I have now decided that I agree with everything massive pharmaceutical companies have done since the inception of Big Pharma. Right. I don't know, Cecil, did you have anything you wanted to jump in with on this or... <clears throat> You know, I I will say that one of the things that we spend a lot of time in the book is is about harm, and I think the reason why we do that is to show people, you know, this matters. All these things matter. And I remember, you know, when we first started doing this, you know, a decade ago, you know, you're you're talking to, to people who are saying, well, yeah, but Bigfoot, come on, what's the big deal? If somebody believes in Bigfoot, what is the big deal? And the problem is that uh, is that now. The way people, different Bigfoot people can connect and the way we give Bigfoot uh, play on TV on like there's a whole network now that has like a whole cryptid thing where they just do 
hour and hour and hour after cryptid or hauntings or any of that stuff. And the way they approach that is as if it's a fact. And so you have people who are consuming this media and they're not, they just presume that it's real. They just presume that a guy who's screaming out in the forest, some sound or whatever (laughs) he's communicating with bigfoot and so and they really do believe it and the way they present it is a presenting it in specific so that they trick that and they're not trying to trick the audience what they're trying to do is make sure that you don't leave so that you believe it's true so that you watch the next episode they're not i don't think that they're doing it for some sort of malicious reason to be like i'm tricking all these people they're doing it so that they can sell the next ad break that's why they're doing it it's it's, it's, i mean it's it's literally a monetary that's a monetary solution but you know, I, Do I, you know, I mean, you guys realize if we discovered Bigfoot tomorrow, how screwed Bigfoot would be like in this culture, <laughs> this gawking, ruin everything, paparazzi entertainment culture. I mean, we would burn down the forests just so we could catch a glimpse of Bigfoot before he died of asphyxiation. Right. <laughs> so true. Terrifying. You know, I, I want to add something to that. The the. The natural, I don't know, the the natural element that follows the Bigfoot problem, right, is that we then become used to the idea of confusing facts with opinions. Yeah. And we're we're at a place now where our sort of national discourse and the national dialogue that takes place online, um, by some members intentionally, by many others unintentionally, they are, there's a constant attempt to shift fact over to opinion, right? So those things which we know to be true. There is a there is a genuine movement right now around whether there's a flat fucking earth. Yep. That is yep. insane. Yep. That has been insane for 600 years. That is insane. So here we find ourselves in this tenuous impossible position where the idea of what a fact is is up for grabs. Um talk about navel gazing bullshit but the the reality is that facts matter reality matters these things are important and we have ways to differentiate fact from opinion um and the, the you, cecil you hit on a good point too the the bigfoot people are no different than facebook right what they are trying to do is they're trying to gather your attention mm-hmm. as a commodity right. to sell and one of the best ways that they can do that is to lie to you And it doesn't matter whether they're lying to you about Bigfoot. And this is why we wrote the book, right? This all rhymes. It's all the same bullshit. And you need to be able to see it everywhere that it pops up its head. Because if they're they're willing to lie to you about Bigfoot in order to keep your attention, to sell you an ad, they are absolutely just as willing to show you your fucking shitty uncle's racist screed about January 6th in order to get you to fucking angry face it on Facebook to keep you on platform to look at more ads. It's the same grift. There's literally no difference. All we're doing is putting a new skin over the top of the grift. So if you can identify the things that are obvious and you think are silly, you can apply those same principles that lead you to believe the, the obvious stuff is silly and see the stuff that is maybe more insidious in the same light. And it is important because we can't let facts and opinions be confused as the same thing. We can't allow that. It's it's killing us. It's literally killing us. Look at COVID. Yeah. That is literally killing us. Did you guys uh, see Zuck, Zuckerberg when he was in front of the congressional hearings? And this was back during election season, right? And the politicians, yeah. the Trump type politicians mm-hmm. are running hugely bogus. I mean, not even close to the truth, massively misrepresenting uh, political ads. And they're like, well, don't you feel a sense of responsibility to remove the stuff that is factually wrong? And Zuckerberg just stood there looking like Zuckerberg, really. <laughs> I mean, he just. <laughs> Right? Yeah. I mean, he, I mean, they, he, he, I, he literally just put up his hands. Yeah, this is so. a guy who, yeah. when challenged on Holocaust denial up until just a handful of years ago, yeah. was like, yeah, I think that stuff needs a place to live. And it's like, really? Oh, and fucking really? It gets, Holo- even, it, just, it gets even worse than that, too, Seth, because when we, we just did a story recently where ProPublica, I think it was. ProPublica and Washington and Post. And Washington Post teamed up to go look at... Facebook and these groups and these were the this is during the this is right after the election 
So right after the election last year, into when they uh, they stormed the Capitol, right? So you have this you have this timeline. It's a short timeline. It's like less than a month, but they they were doing they were trying to at a certain point try to stomp on these groups that would pop up and post false information. And so they they had a way to find it. They had an algorithm. They went to go find it, and then right after the election, they disbanded the committee. And then they started just yeah. letting these letting these groups pop up. And what you have is the explosion of these groups because there's these peaks and valleys in this graph. And you can completely see this valley that happened right before the election. And then right after the election, it jumps right back right up. Right back up. And they they that that's and they literally they they got all their marching orders from each other based on based on the, these Facebook groups that Zuckerberg was he just didn't want to take down because he was making too much ad revenue. The, uh, you know, the rise of these totally, I mean, I say niche, but I mean, they're, some of them are pretty significant. These sort of alt information pods, you know, the Newsmaxes and the OANs right. and, you know, yeah. America First News dot Eagle slash Freedom <laughs> dot whatever the website is. Right? <laughs> uh, you know, have you noticed? I mean, they all have flags and they've got the red, white and blue, yeah. a la Fox News. And I mean, it's really terrifying. I used to I, I must have been monumentally naive, guys, because I would have thought, well, we would, we, you know, we've seen nationalism here. Yeah, we've seen a kind of zealot nationalism among hardcore fundy Christians. I never thought we would see the type of sort of wild fascist, jingoistic, yeah. you know, flag waving, yeah, well, <laughs> xenophobia. I, I, where have I, I'm, I've learned such a lesson about the world, you know, a hard lesson. I don't know if you, do you guys feel that? Like, I thought it would be bad. I never expected this. I, I thought, I'll, I used to be super optimistic. I thought things were getting better. I used to make a lot of noise about how I was a Steven Pinker guy. You know, I thought things were getting a lot better. Yeah, me too. I really yeah. was. I, and I would, I would fight tooth and nail with people that said yeah. that it wasn't. You know, it used to be, to, to your point, it used to be that, there was a show called The Colbert Report, right? And it was a bald eagle in flags. And, yeah. caw, caw, caw. and that was a satirical show. Yeah, it was all satire. That yeah. somehow is now like mainstream right-wing reality. It's almost like they watched a satirical, <laughs> like they watched Colbert and they're like, you know, that's actually a great idea. <laughs> They're like got a guy who's quickly compositing it right. on After Effects so they can use we, it later. We, That's we've, amazing. We've reached a place where like hyperbole has yeah. become nearly impossible because yeah. we talk about this. I we, we talk about pose, this at dinner. Pose, yeah, and it's like Pose Law is like you can't even you can't even discern anymore. You can't sometimes the difference between what is real because you're like that guy can't be he can't be real like for real real. Yeah. Well, and, we've we've entered this age too where we have we have. We have embraced a trollification yeah, of reality right? yeah. that has infected politics and it's infected news where the idea of trolling has become like a almost a virtue. If not a virtue, <laughs> it's at least excusable Tom, or it's politically pragmatic. Do you remember when we first started? We thought, I'm not even kidding, Seth. I'm 100%. Oh God, I, know where this is going. I think we even might have said it in the first few shows. We didn't know how long the show was going to last because the world was going to turn atheist and everyone was going to embrace skepticism. Yeah. And it, this is kind of one of those. It's one of those last hurrah. Let's laugh at the people who are who are not sort of caught up yet, but they will be soon. We thought the fringe would stay on the fringe st or at least be adopted into the main. Yeah, and right. that skepticism was the main. And God, were we wrong? We were so wrong. Be, yeah. Like, you know, Seth made Seth made a point. I, I want to. The OAN, the all those little niche, you know, it reminds me now of the way music is consumed. So the so the way we consume all media has changed. So it used to be, and this is no longer the case. It used to be that you got in your car. We all remember this because we're all old. You got in the car, you turn on the radio. Yeah, and everybody knew the same radio sure. songs. Everybody knew the hits, right? right? So we had a cultural connection that we shared almost no matter who we are because. I got in my car. You got in your car. We both turn on the radio. We're listening to the same thing. I know the top 40. You know the top 40. I know all the all the big rock songs. You know all the big rock songs, et cetera, et cetera. But the world has changed so that the way we consume media is this sort of like quasi-tailored, algorithmic, bespoke experience. And the the media that we consume becomes more and more niche. Yeah. 
nobody gets in the car and turns on the radio, so to speak, anymore. We go and we choose a podcast to listen to. We select, and it's not to shit on podcasts. Or a Pandora station. Or a Pandora That's station. tailored we're, for you. We're constantly curating and tailoring, but that means we're always narrowing and filtering. And so to stay current, your OANs have to be niche. Everything yeah, is niche. It has to be super niche. Everything niche. is a niche. Because yeah. there is no, like broadcast to the masses anymore right. the masses have said we don't want that so now what you have to do is you have to constantly slice the pie cater to a niche slice the pie cater to a niche and that's that's become dangerous right that's how we end up with incel culture well i, I was thinking about that uh, sort of satirical adam savage quote from mythbusters where he says i reject your reality and substitute my own <laughs> yeah, right right there's like that guy on um reddit you know, he just for the hell of it, just fictionalized a conspiracy theory. And just a few of the points were that Moderna, which produces a COVID vaccine, actually came out of the um, industry that gassed the Jews during the Holocaust. Oh, and Jeffrey Epstein was once a majority stockholder oh, in Moderna. And George Soros, the liberal billionaire, was once a Nazi, and and they, Bill Gates and Fauci roomed yeah. together <laughs> yeah, yeah, at they, Cornell and came up with the radio trackers, you know. They and they he just bullet pointed this whole thing into like one little paragraph, thinking, "Ha ha, he's tweaking the sure, conspiracy sure. people." What do this is how far the Overton window has gone? Yep. The conspiracy people read that and said, "You're damn right," <laughs> yeah, and then they went viral with it. And treated it yep. as gospel. Yep. Yep. It was shared by my mother <laughs> on Facebook. <laughs> but but it has a double-edged sword there, though, Seth, because it was shared by your mother on Facebook, but it was also shared by dozens of, or if not hundreds of thousands of people who thought it was funny. So it had a great effect right. in that it was shared by both sides. One to say, what the fuck could, you know, this is, this is a what the fuck moment for everybody who reads this. This is what your conspiracy yep. sounds like. And then the other people are being like, this is a manna from heaven. This is what our conspiracy is yeah. moment. <laughs> yeah. And it was shared by both sides. Yeah. And then both sides, you know, and, and it's literally, it's like, it's like, a, uh, what are they, Rorschach? Is that what they call that? The Rorschach? Rorschach test? Oh, the Rorschach yeah. test, Where, yeah. You know, like, like people saw that meme and they decided when they read it, which way they were going to lean. Absolutely, were they, yep. Were they, were they pro? Were they anti? And that's, the, I think, one of the major problems with meme culture is that what we do is we make a joke. Somebody will make a joke out there and people will take it seriously. And they and there's no like there's nobody there to like nudge you like when I tell if I if I were to play a prank on Tom I'm at least there to be like uh, I was I was yeah, fuck, I was fucking yeah, with right. you I was fucking that that's not real but it's not it's like genuinely at this point we're in this in this meme culture where someone can make what is clearly a joke send it out into the world and there's people out there that will take it as truth well I, I well I think probably if I may quickly the more frustrating part for me was I went in and I essentially refuted the points. <laughs> yeah. Epstein was never a major stockholder. Right, right. Moderna, no. And and uh, Soros was actually a Hungarian Jew <laughs> who escaped the Holocaust. And, you know, when Fauci was at Cornell, Bill Gates was 10. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's so he was easy. Like, Dude, he was yeah. smart, man. Yeah. And nobody cared about no, the refutation. No, 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 it doesn't make any difference. Nobody cared. No, we, we it's almost it like when we go through... Specific religious texts, we'll call it the Bible in this country, and you're like, this has been debunked, this is absolutely not true, yeah. this is morally atrocious, and they just look at you, well, like Zuckerberg, and they just blink, <laughs> and it doesn't make any difference what the what the data says. It's maddening. So, what, anyway, what, go ahead. What is go interesting, ahead. though, Seth, is that we've seen studies that say that the exact opposite is true, is that debunking it is the way to convince people. And I, I, I have never seen this work. I've never seen never somebody either. go to an internet thread and be like, yes, okay, no, you've convinced me of this. But there have been studies that we've talked about on our show where people have used a debunking technique and has convinced people that they're, do, they're saying or thinking the wrong things. 
They, that's a unicorn, I, right? Has that been like sighted, it, it actually like sighted either. in the wild? I, that's Bigfoot. I feel, yep. so. Yeah, I'm motivated to believe that it's wrong. <laughs> well, I, I, I buy that, I think, beyond the one-on-ones. It's almost like when there's a debate, yeah. right? You never see one guy look at the other guy and go, you know, you're absolutely right. I'm going to completely reverse my position, debate over. Everyone have a good yeah. night. We'll refund you at the gate. But, right? but the audience that debate moves. is not to change the mind of the interlocutors. It's really for the people watching in the wings yeah. from a position of safety yeah right i think that's what all of us are thinking right now is that the guy who's reading the comments yep. who you never get to talk to is the one who's going to get convinced by that because he may come in with a different mindset and think oh i'm totally with the QAnon guys and then he reads the debunking and he's like oh god yeah no maybe i'm not and he never comments he's never part of right. the thread but he might be the one who's convinced i like i say i've never seen it work like you say on the person who you're debating how many debates have you been how many debates has matt de Hunty been in he's never he's never going to convince you know one of those big religious guys they're never going to be like oh no you're right yeah no it's, that's my bad i, right. I, I yeah. totally i'm a i'm an atheist now can i come on your call and show? matt de yeah. not getting communion yeah. with one of these <laughs> exactly things it's right. over right there's yeah. not it's not going to happen <laughs> so but but there's somebody in the audience like you say from position of safety they may see that they may think you know what I, yep. I don't believe that anymore. But I mean, back to QAnon, you guys remember back when they all congregated by the hundreds in Dallas waiting <laughs> on the appearance of JFK oh, Jr., still? who was going yeah. to join there, Trump, Seth. I guess, John, John. to run for office. Yeah. <laughs> but I was reading, I was reading, though, and some of the people who, for some reason, felt like JFK Jr. had not been dead for 20 years and was somehow hiding and infiltrating and just, I mean, bat shittery beyond belief, they bought into it. Yeah. But when he didn't show up <laughs> after they had spent yeah. all this money and time and invested so much of yeah. themselves and they were faced with that utter disappointment and they began to see that maybe some of the other things their QAnon leaders yeah. Yeah. weren't adding up, they actually began to walk themselves right. out. And yeah. I found that encouraging. Biden's, that was Biden's inauguration was the same thing for some some of the QAnon people. Yeah, there was a lot of folks. Those people that were that that they 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 were on the message boards afterwards on like the parlors and the other places where they were congregating and they were talking to each other saying, I don't know what to believe anymore. I just saw Biden inaugurated. Right. And, and we were told president Trump is going to be the president now from all these Q things. And now it did like my whole world has collapsed. And so yeah. there were some people who walked themselves back, but then we, I listened to a story and I cannot remember where I heard it. I must've been the daily or something where they were interviewing these Q and on people and they interview this woman and she initially, she's like a really bright lady. She went Harvard to like a, a Yale lady, yeah. or Harvard or something. She was a really smart lady, but she was all in on the queue and sh and and after biden got inaugurated she kind of started to walk herself back but then dove deeper into it so then you know like it, it's it's one of those things like like if you try to pull yourself out of it it's uncomfortable and i think people want to be comfortable I also i'll bring it back you know again there there's a community issue there yeah you know if you spend four or five years in community online with all these people and you've got this camaraderie yeah. and relationships yeah. and people aren't just talking about Q people are also talking about their kids and their spouses and their lives and their work and they're trading fucking you know brown betty recipes yep. and shit yep. these are their friends and they're gonna walk away from that entire community just because it's not true i mean if that was the case we'd have a lot less people going to church yeah right so there's there's a community piece which is a really important and difficult piece that we have to recognize when we look at people that have these difficult bad ideas they don't exist in a, a vacuum they all exist in as part of a, a social continuum as part and they all have a social contagious element so we have to recognize and i think to some degree empathize with how difficult it is and seth you wrote a whole book about this how difficult it is to walk away from that and to have to reevaluate all those things that you've held dear yeah. and all those relationships. Well, it's like Christianity. Like, are most of my neighbors and friends and people in the Bible Belt and wherever, do they go to church because they are theologically serious? Or <laughs> yeah. do they go because the church is relevant to them culturally? It's their yeah. friends, right. it's their child care, it's their entertainment, it's their support system in times of trouble. I mean, it's really a cultural faith yeah. that has very yeah. little knowledge about the uh, the dogmas and the actual mission statements and the verses themselves. Talking here with Tom and Cecil, 
author of the new book, The Grand Unified Theory of Bullshit. Man, after what we've spoken about so far, I feel like I need a detox. <laughs> I need a cleanse. <laughs> you get into some of that, I know. I, I, we've already gotten into alternative medicine, but I, I have to do maybe an awkward segue, and we got to talk about Dr. Oz. You guys been following his Senate run in yeah, Pennsylvania? Yeah. Only, what are your thoughts, gentlemen? Just, just take it from there when I say Dr. Oz. You know, Dr. Oz, I saw him today. There was a clip from him today walking into a store uh, and he walked up and he said, yeah, my wife wants to make something. And I forget exactly what he said, but he's like, well, I got to pick some things up. So he grabs broccoli and he's like, this is going to be two dollars. And he picks up the tiniest little Florida broccoli. It says it's going to be two dollars. And then he starts grabbing things and he grabs this gigantic bag of pick carrots. And he says, this will be four dollars. And he's like, all this. And he, he just has like five items. He's like, this is this is over twenty dollars. And that's Joe Biden's fault. <laughs> and I thought, I thought that's a perfect, that's perfect. He has a, no idea. This is a guy, he's like so disconnected from reality. Right. He's never technically actually been in a store before. You know, he says the first time he's seen people standing behind a register because he's fucking gotten his d groceries delivered his whole life or whatever. And so now he's there to try to like make some sort of statement. But, you know, Dr. Oz, Dr. Oz has been a grifter for years, yep. for absolutely for years. He's been showing terror terrible shit on TV to giant media audiences. And he's been, and he's doing things like he's basically, his show is essentially what the tabloids say when you go to check out. So like, if you yep, need the yep. best, hottest diet thing, he's going to talk about it on his show. He's going to talk about these cleanses and these superfoods and all this stuff. That's just like nutritionally and scientifically bullshit, but he's going to talk about it on his show because he wants to put eyeballs on his show because he wants yep. those people to stare at that screen for the next ad break. So his, his revenue is uh, the people who, who write his check every week. They want it. He wants to make sure he has the biggest audience possible and he's going to use that to get a Senate run. I have no idea how well he's going to do. I haven't been paying attention I to the numbers I, at all. One of the things that bothers me more, most about him is the fact that if you look back at his medical credentials and his degree, like his pedigree on paper, you would think, oh yeah, legitimate medicine, right? Yeah. He's obviously going to be sure. science-based. And so if he pinballs out of that into fucking Reiki yeah. healing, right? Reiki energies and yeah, but he what he called, he called Reiki like the ultimate alternative <laughs> medicine with healing energies, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, that I think makes him even more dangerous. I'm sorry, Tom, go yeah, ahead. I, you had something on Dr. Yeah, Ross? Yeah, I, just, I was just going to say, I, but I don't think he... He doesn't fucking believe it. He's not just wrong. He's a liar. And he's an intentional liar. And we know this because he's been called in front of Congress and he's been called out for lying. So, like, it's actually kind of funny that he's now running. Like, Dr. Oz has had he's he's been he's promoted you know, like I think it was like green coffee beans or some other nonsense that he's promoted as these quack therapies and these alternative healing therapies and they don't work yeah. at all they don't work and he's been called out in front in in public on this stuff and he backpedals and he he shimmies and he shifts and he lies he basically he comes out well you know i i never said that it was that it was but he did say he would come out on his show and say it's the next miracle and they would have clips of him on his show saying this is the next miracle weight loss cure and he would use unambiguous language but then when he's in front of you know investigators or con congress or whatever and they're saying hey he said well I, you know i'm suggesting that it might work he's a fucking liar is what he is so yeah he's got a great degree but this pays better that was how they played it with hydroxychloroquine like well what's the harm i mean you know it yeah. could work it could be a miracle Oof. cure i mean i'm just saying you Oof. know and sort of that non-committal thing in the right. book you um you sort of bump out of old medicine and homeopathy. You have the guts to take on chiropractic, which means you must not have nearly enough hate mail. <laughs> uh, talk about a contentious subject. Like, yeah. uh, Yvette yeah. Dontremont, the, the Psy Babe, has an article that she posted a few years ago, and it's just titled, Chiropractic is Bullshit. And I know Dr. Harriet Hall of Science-Based Medicine has gotten into it, how it was essentially started by a grocer. And, you know, these chiropractics and the, these this sort of medical board, I, the organization that certifies yeah. chiropractic, they're all kind of an in-group. Like, yeah. this is a, a, a hotbed of woo. They're always pitching oh, yeah. these wacky, totally unsubstantiated things. And 
And I think uh, Dr. Hall said something like it may help with lower back pain, but all this other bullshit about subluxations, you are being lied to, yeah. yep. right? Crack your back, cure your asthma. Get the fuck out of yeah. here. What are you talking yeah. about? Yeah, it might help. It, 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 what, what's annoying to me about chiropractic as somebody who's had back problems is if it does help, I'd like to know. And then I would like to go get a sure. modality of treatment that is effective. Yeah. But you can't even do that because they've confused and conflated all of the treatments to the point where I think these chiropractors believe their own bullshit. Yeah. Because to be to be fair to them, they go to chiropractic yeah. college. You know, if I go to clown college, I'm going to learn to be a clown, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's how that works. It is. All it your is. professors are it fucking is. clowns. You know, it's what's crazy, send too. The, send those hate letters to <laughs> Tom doesn't give a shit what you think at cogdis.com. You know, it's a lot like oh, feng shui, God. though, for the body. Because, you know, when you talk to one chiropractor and you say, yep. well, this is a subluxation, and then you go to another one, they can't point to the same subluxation. Right. So if you can't all look at something and say this is a thing, then that's not a science, man. That's that's just a fucking art of you being able to move my hand over here and make my back snap. That's all it is. And and the other thing, too, is that they dip into not just it's not just I crack your back and now you don't have migraines anymore. It's well, let me do a little acupuncture on you. Yeah. Let's let's get let's get you in this in this tank that has like plays nice music and has crystals in the side of it. Let's get the Reiki guys in here. I'm going to sell you. Yeah. Like sell you supplements. You buy your juicer from me. All, they, yep. they, they dip their hands into a million other things and they grift wherever they can. This is, that's a very common thing that most chiropractors do. So, you know, how can we take you seriously if that's the case? And also show me the medical evidence. That's yep. what I want to see. Yeah. I don't want to see like, I don't want to hear like, yeah, maybe it made my back feel good once. I want to see the medical evidence that shows that this anecdote is actually true. Yep. Well, w one of the things I think we're up against, though, is the it worked for me defense. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I don't sure. know. I haven't seen any experiments. All I know is I went and I felt better. Yep. And, you know, it's hard to deal with that. You know, if someone has a genuine feeling of improvement, placebo effect sure. or not, you know, we're like, well, Why? Do you know for sure? But I mean, that's a, a real challenge if we're trying to nail it down. You guys good for time? I got a few more questions for yeah, you. Yeah, we're and, good. And you're always so much fun to talk we're to. Good. You've been watching the Pope? I know you guys just love the Catholic <laughs> Church. <laughs> I actually Pope don't know Francis, what the Pope's up to right now. Er, hold on. What, what did he do? Earlier this month, he makes an apology for the atrocities in Canada regarding the I indigenous children. You know, they found the burial yeah, site yeah, of sure, all those... Yeah. Uh, indigenous children who had been abused and whatnot. And if so you follow he comes the Catholics long enough, you'll find dead bodies, guaranteed. If you follow them long enough. Do you see Pope Francis is more of, um, I mean, do you see him as more real? Do you feel like he's dragging the church forward? Do you think he's just as culpable as everybody else? I, I know this is just subjective yeah. opinion, but talk to me. What do you think? This is all, this is all just we got caught sort of thing. You know, there's so many things that they know about that they've known about for years that they've, that they continue to do. The pre shuffling is one of those things that they continue yeah. to do and that they've done for years where someone will get in trouble, diddling a kid somewhere. And then they will take that person. They will put them across the world or across in another country and they'll place them. And very often they'll place them without any restrictions whatsoever. And they'll wind up with kids. They'll be in like youth camps. They'll yep. be around kids constantly and then they'll do it again. And then they'll shift them to another place and they never go to the authorities. You know what? It's top down. Bullshit should roll downhill in the Catholic Church. If you're not excommunicating every single pedophile in your ranks, I don't fucking believe you. Period. The end. Yeah, that's I, how it is. It, I don't. Pope Francis is as full of shit as all the rest of them, and and it's obvious because you, you look at like, and I think it was in Canada as well. But the, there was a. I remember there was there was some massive lawsuit, and the church said, "Okay, well we'll pay the lawsuit, but we need to raise money to do it. So we have to have a fundraiser, yep, a bake yep. sale, and." And, all, and so they don't dip into their coffers and pay it. They create new revenue yeah. to pay out the lawsuits from the horrors and yep, atrocities yep. that they've created. They, let's, let's be super clear. The Pope is not wrestling with complex moral issues here. Like, it is not a complex moral issue. Should we have taken those kids away from their families and neglected them yeah. to the point of their death? 
Should we have should we have maybe notified someone when those kids fucking died? Yeah. Should we have you know dealt with sexual predators yeah. in literally any other possible way? These aren't complex. Should we have swept issues. it under the rugs for decades. Right. Come on. They, 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 so we should never pretend that there is a complexity here to deal with that doesn't actually exist. Yeah. There is no complexity yeah. here. These are simple issues that any ethicist would be able to bang out in the better part of an yeah. afternoon with room for tea. We've been talking about this for decade, uh, a decade on our show. And, and, and Tom, I think is the one who, who sort of coined this on our show. And he's like, no tolerance policy for sex abuse is the easiest thing in the world to have. Yeah. Every single, every single company has one, you know, it's a no tolerance policy. The moment it happens, you're fired. We call the police and it's the end of the, it's the end of the thing. And they don't have one. And so until that happens, I don't believe you, Pope Same. Francis, I don't care how many trees you hug. I don't yeah. fucking believe you. Wait, an apology from a Christian is actually the least useful thing I've ever fucking yeah. heard because <laughs> theologically, that's their get out of jail yeah, free right. card. <laughs> I, I can do whatever yeah. the fuck I want right. as long as I feel bad want. about it. Exactly. Yeah. Right? Oh, I felt bad, so I got forgiven. Exactly. Forgiveness is a massive moral problem, I think, in Christianity. It's a it's a bug in their theology yeah. because it, it makes it so that they don't have to hold themselves truly morally sure. culpable. Sure. Because they get to say, yeah. oopsie, my uh, bad. Uh, uh, oops, yeah. Get the fuck out of yeah. here with your my bad. It's like the confessional. I mean, wouldn't it be nice? You go out and you do whatever you want for seven days, yeah. and then you just go in, hit the reset. Sure. Right. Right? Yeah. A couple of Hail Marys. Yeah, and yeah it's like a sin you're out, shower. You're off. Yeah, yeah. Just run right out There's some there. stuff we oops, shouldn't sin be forgiven shower. for. That sounds, <laughs> sounds kind of naughty. That does sound kind of nice. I'm yeah. definitely going to do some Hail Marys Going to the American Atheist Conference. You need to you need to set up, Seth Andrews, a sin shower down at the American Atheist Conference. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Uh, let's see. Human rights abuses. Of course, we're talking about these draconian abortion bans. My home state, Oklahoma, just in the House passed the most restrictive abortion ban in the United States. And, uh, you know, I, I'm struck by how I'll bet most of these people, they don't give a shit about the babies that are actually born. No. Right? No. They're obsessed with the fetus. No. They're obsessed with controlling a woman's reproductive cycle and her decisions. And I mean, there's so much at play here that's rooted in 2000 year old biblical misogyny, et cetera. I mean, it just blows my mind. You guys been going through, I'm sure Chicago's got to be a little more yeah, level headed on some of this fine, stuff, right? But yeah. Last week we talked to, so last week on our show, um, 623 is I think the number. Um, we talked to an abortion provider in Texas. So Texas just passed this law six months ago called SB8. And SB8, what it does is it basically turns the public into vigilantes. And they are able to whoever to sue whoever helped facilitate an abortion. So they can't go after the person who got the abortion. So the woman who got the abortion. But anything after six weeks, they can sue the provider of the abortion, the you know, the, the person who, who helped pay for it, they can even sue the Uber driver who gave her a, a lift to get the abortion. They can sue all these people. And so what they're doing is they're weaponizing the public to stop abortion. And it's had an effect on these abortion providers because they don't want to get sued. They don't want to lose this money. That's, you know, it's, it's, it's bankrupting essentially. So they don't want to do it. And so we talked to somebody last week and they told us something that we didn't realize was that down there, you can't just go in if you've if you've been if you got an abortion if you want to get an abortion you can't just walk in and be like yeah I think I'm pregnant can I get some drugs or something they actually have to find it first so what Texas wants them to do is they have to find and make sure that the person is pregnant before they can prescribe any kind of medications for it so what it does is it takes that window of what's supposed to be six weeks and it length it shortens it down to because like five days to like she five said. days she said it's essentially five days they have to come in and it's having the opposite effect of what we thought they wanted which was more people to consider pregnancy instead more people that she says she has the same or more abortions because what they're doing is they're saying they're coming in and they're like fuck i gotta decide in five days uh, abortion because they don't want to get stuck with a kid and so yeah. and so they're they're choosing abortion when they may not have any other time. And so it's it's really fucked up and it is a hundred percent women controlling that's all it yep. is that's all it is yeah I'm I am convinced that to a large degree, the, the the point of all the abortion restriction is to force as many women as possible out of the workforce so men don't have to economically compete with them. I, I'm, I am convinced that that is a major driver in the abortion argument 
It's not being it's it's a, it's not being said out loud. But it, yeah. if you keep women pregnant and then you keep them in a traditional model of yep. marriage where then they have to raise the kid and stay home, then, you know, you're pushing more women out of the workforce and men don't have to compete with women economically in the in the workplace. I think this is well, economic we warfare against yeah. women. That's How well uh, the evangelicals have handled reproductive decisions here in the Bible Belt states, right? Because we are near the top of the chart in teen pregnancy and STDs and all, you know, porn use, right? If you want to find people topping the charts, you just go to all these sort of purity culture, uh, sexually repressed states, these sort of Bible-thumping moralists, and you look at the statistics and you realize that, man, we're talking about a tremendous amount of hypocrisy going on, and the lack of sex education, the lack of, of reproductive choices is actually having, in many ways, an opposite effect, as Cecil had just said. I find that interesting. I, th I think it's I think it's interesting, but if you if you buy my theory that the point is to move as many women into pregnancy and keep them pregnant for as much time as possible in order to remove them from the workforce, then you would do exactly this. You would not want to have access to high quality contraception. You would not want to have uh, high quality uh, sex education delivered at an early age and repeated frequently throughout the course of someone's education. Because yeah. what you want is for more people to get pregnant. And then you want them to be saddled with that birth. And actually, you want that to happen at an earlier age when they're less economically viable. It, it, this is, it, it seems fairly clear that whether, whether it's the stated goal or whether it's just, just a, a, a holy cow, it's here's certain, a bunch of, yeah, it, it's it all, sure is convenient. Sure yeah. is convenient yeah. that it's always dudes making these decisions and they have literally everything to gain. And they I, gain everything. I do everything. see, though, in fairness, and I wrote about this a little bit a few years ago, there is a deep-seated conviction that the second the herb, the egg and the sperm get together, there's like a ray of light and there's little fireworks and, <laughs> and there's harp music and confetti comes down from heaven. <laughs> and, you know, what? a tiny human being is created and that, per, that being has a soul. And this is sold, it's rampant in the evangelical Christian churches. Sure. I was, and I think many people are genuinely convinced that this conceived fertilized egg is a human being that must be protected. Now, we don't stop to ask why a God that genuinely gives a shit wouldn't just come down and prevent the abortion and have a right. conversation with the woman involved. No, no, no. He needs a bunch of 60-year-old <laughs> elected evangelical Republican conservatives in Oklahoma to cast a vote without debate to rule over the women, right? Because that's the biblical model. But a lot of a lot of people, men and women, really do believe they are protecting yeah. a human but life. And I think that's fair to say. That's I think that's fair to say too. But I think too, you know, when you look at the Texas law, for instance, and you talk about how they have to see it before they administer any kind of uh, any kind of medicine. You know, the the day after pill just prevents you know prevents things from even adhering. So it just like makes it so that there's nothing can happen. Well, that's what your science yeah. says, right? So <laughs> so you know, like if if they're if they're really adhere if they really do feel like that conception is the moment something is born. They would be yeah. they would be trying to prevent the conception part more readily. Right. Yeah. They would be trying to stop that, not by abstinence only, but through condoms and through sex ed and through free birth control pills and you know, you name it. There's plenty of ways to stop that from happening. So if that's the thing you're really out to get, then do it. But they don't. What yeah. they do is they, 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 try to, they try to seize upon the back end. And then they try to demonize abortion by talking about late-term abortions as if that's a thing that is common and that happens all the time. You know, Roe v. Wade already has massive restrictions in it. All across the country has massive restrictions in it. And people don't understand that. When, they, when you hear, you know, it's, it, the first trimester is free and clear, but after that, there's a lot of, there's a lot of roadblocks. And people People don't get that that's all across the country. That's not just one place. That's all across the country. Well, I think one thing, too, that's not uh, understood by especially among evangelicals. I didn't know this when I was a devout believer. I had to actually be taught that roughly half of all fertilized eggs do not come to term. Yeah. They're yeah. flushed right. out through right. menstruation, right? Roughly half yep. of all fertilized eggs do not make it into a live birth of a baby. Yep. Meaning 
that their intelligent designer is actually the most <laughs> prolific abortion doctor in the history of all things. Yeah. Right. I, it's, it's rolling. It's it's li- fucking flipping a coin. Yeah. Is, is what it, it's. You know, I will say, too, and I hear you that that I think that there's a lot of people who really, truly believe in their heart exactly what you described, that a, a, a sperm meets an egg and there's the big, you know, huzzah moment. But I will also say that I think it's very true that religion now and always has been very adept at putting a moralistic and narrative skin over the top of the power structures that it wants to control yeah. and to enshrine. And that's yeah. what religion okay. has always been good at. And so just because most people are sort of fooled by the narrative doesn't mean that that's not a function of the narrative. Oh, you know what? I'm just going to give you the uh, I'm going to give you the direct Twitter account of the transformed wife. And you can, <laughs> you can have uh, your own conversation about women with the transformed wife. Tom, Tom much. the other day we were talking about Twitter and Tom, Tom tried to log on and he and he's like, I can't get on. And I said, are you using the app? And he said, no, I tried to do it through the browser on my phone. <laughs> so Tom I, is not a Tom is not a tweeter, my friend. I'm Tom not, is not I'm a not tweeter. Tweeted. Tom, it's not a He's tweet. like AOL. I've got to <laughs> dial up. I no. hear a, I hear tones. I hear a modem. It, it's funny because Cecil asked me. He's like, "Hey, are you trying to log into our Twitter account?" He he so didn't believe that it was me. He was getting ready to change. the I was password. ready to change the password, but then I got a, a notification that someone was trying to log in, and so I thought, "Well, it's got to be one of the people who work for us." It certainly isn't Tom. And then <laughs> and then later, I just out of whim before I changed the password, I just sent him a quick message. Did you try to log into Twitter? He's like, "Yeah, I just gave up after one try." <laughs> <laughs> I will. And it's then like trying like, to teach you your, want- uh, your grandma how to program the Blu-ray player. You know, it's just not going to work. Then he's like, hey, do you, do you want me to get it set? I was like, no, I, I've no, already I, lost interest. I've, I've already I, lost interest. I don't want to do it. It and didn't I work not immediately, and I app. don't care. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Have you guys, uh, I finally, and I'm, I may just undo it. I may just delete it. I finally dipped my toe into TikTok. Someone oh. said, you got to be on TikTok. How's that going? Uh, I, you know, I, Great. I'm personally offended by vertical <laughs> video. It kills a part of me. If I have a soul, it kills my soul yeah. to see vertical video. Yeah, man. Because um, I'm that guy. When yeah. I see vertical yeah. video, I'm like, turn the phone <laughs> horizontal. I'm always screaming at people. Right? <laughs> but, uh, you know, I posted a couple of things. Have you guys tried TikTok? Our, Are you going to bother Our producer with it? keeps trying to get us to watch TikTok videos. So he'll send us TikTok videos. And then when we do our live stream, we live stream every Thursday on YouTube and Twitch and Facebook. And he always sends us these things to watch and get our reaction. And Tom and I are almost always horrified because he's, <laughs> he always sends us hor- horrific things, well, he does, but, he does. but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's not anything, you know, I haven't tried to download it at all. I saw that a couple of people in the podcasting realm are starting to do it. But you know, when I came back from, a, I came back from a conference, Seth, 11, over 11 years ago, 12 years ago. And uh, it was a conference on new media. And I remember telling Tom, there's this thing called Twitter. It's micro blogging is what it, what it was called back then. And he said, what the hell do you do with it? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still, still have- don't know the answer to that question, Seth. I still don't uh, know the So TikTok is a little beyond us. We're t- yeah, I'm having a hard time keeping yeah, up. My- I mean, I've, I've got I've got my MySpace account. So that's, <laughs> I've got Prodigy and CompuServe, and they're just hey, such a burden. Off. But got- they're such a burden. Uh, okay, Tom and Cecil of Cognitive Dissonance, co-authors of the new book, The Grand Unified Theory of Bullshit. This is how naive I am, and I've published like four books. I didn't realize until I saw The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Have you seen that book? Mm -hmm. Uh, I didn't realize you could actually put swear words in a book. (laughs) I I didn't, like when I saw it, I I thought, wow, can you do that? Are there publishing restrictions? Can you, you know, did you you run into that? Did you have that conversation? Yeah, so when you pay for it on your own, you can do literally whatever you want, Seth. You can do anything you want when you pay to publish your own work. (laughs) But I will say this, our editor tried to convince us to not do it. She tried multiple times to say, you're not going to sell it to anybody else. And I said, we know. It's okay. <laughs> so that was the end of the conversation. But yeah, we, we we were told not to, but then we just decided to. So I'll link it in the description box, not to read the last part of the book, but obviously you do leave the reader with some tools, right? And it's not enough to say the world's full of insanity and the fog of war and massive misinformation and craziness and pseudoscience and woo and superstition. So then you, you know, you don't just overwhelm us, but you also give us some tools. So without reading the end of the book, I mean, give me a couple of examples of the type of stuff that you leave the reader with. 
I, I think the the first thing is to when when we're thinking about how we inform ourselves, we have to have intentionality to that process. We are, and th- this is this is I think one of the one of the biggest takeaways. Um, without reading the whole book, which you should buy, um, that you should, <laughs> yeah, you should you should get. But we we need to we need to be very intentional about how we inform ourselves. We the more often you see a message repeated, the more likely you are to believe that that message is true, and that that message has always been true. And and I, here's an example that that I would offer everybody that you know, and you've done it, and I've done it, and Cecil's done it, has done the same thing. Where you say to someone in the middle of telling a story, you know, I I, I read a book once, or I read an article about. Where I, I saw this this movie about, and you have no idea where you heard what you're about to say next. You just know that you have absorbed some information, and you don't remember the provenance of that information. That is something you should avoid with an intentional information gathering process. The more intentional you are in your information gathering, the more likely you are to get things right. You are not going to get everything right. That's okay. But as long as you understand you're not the outlier... And that you have to guard against your own interests and your own uh, self-deception and that you intentionally inform yourself and never unintentionally inform yourself and guard yourself against unintentional sources of information. You'll get closer to being right more often than not. Yeah, I you know, one of the one of the biggest problems we have nowadays is that we gather our information from sources of entertainment. And we think Tom and I, while we do do this, right, we know what our podcast is. It is a source of entertainment, but we never tell anybody just to get take what we say and run with it. We want to make sure we put every link for everything we do into the show notes. We want somebody to go and check our work. We want to get that correction at the end of the week that says, hey, guys, you got this wrong. We want to get that because we always want to be working toward true. And so and so the, the, the fact is, is that we're all susceptible, very much more susceptible when we're being entertained. And that happens a lot on Facebook. You know, when you're just scrolling through and you see somebody's news story and then you might share it with just because you read the headline or maybe even the first paragraph. And I will tell you, many people don't even read the first paragraph. They just read the headline. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, it's all about trying to filter that information and try to try to come at the world as, as with sort of a clean in sort of a clean way where you're sort of stripping those things away and being very intentional with the information that you're gathering. And it's hard. It isn't easy. And no. we don't, we, and it, you're going to fail and you're not going to be good at it. And it's going to take practice, but so do all good things. And so you just got to keep practicing it. Tom and Cecil from cognitive dissonance. I'll link to the show and the book in the description box. And I guess in the next couple of years, I'm going to have to double or triple up some episodes so I can get to a thousand before you do. <laughs> we will, or I'll be riding your coattails into a episode one thousand, like waving my hand in the air, going, "Notice me! Notice me!" Seth, thank you so much for having us on. We appreciate yeah, man, this it. was great. Really appreciate you. You guys are always a joy. You know, you're just so smart and funny. You've got great chemistry together, and I'm excited for you. And and you know, it's it's it had to have felt good when this sucker came out, right? Oh. I mean, I know these things are so much harder than people realize. Yeah. Like, no, unless you've authored a book, you have no idea. Like, you guys agonize, you write, and you rewrite, and you've got editing and developmental editing, and you go back and rethink, and yeah. and then you second guess yourself, and even when it releases, you think, will anybody care? And it's really <laughs> well done, guys. It's really well done, and you should be congratulated. So, congratulations, and thanks again. Oh, it's very sweet. Thank you. Thank you, Seth.